Perfect. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on this very snowy day. Hope you're all warm and safe wherever you are tuning in from. Um, we are here today for the Professional Development Workshop, The Gift of Crisis Leadership. Uh, the Duluth Chamber is very proud to provide this offering free of charge to our chamber members because of the generosity of our sponsor, the College of St. Scholastica Stender School of Leadership, Business, and Professional Studies. Before I go ahead and introduce our keynote speaker for today, I would first like to invite Joe Rembowitz, an admissions counselor at the college, to provide a few remarks on behalf of their sponsorship. So, Joe, thank you for tuning in. Yeah, thank you, Chris, and thanks everyone for joining. I hope everyone is staying safe with the uh, Snowmageddon situation. Um, yeah, welcome. Uh, I'm Joe. I'm an adm admissions counselor. I work with the Stender School over at St. Scholastica. Just like to let everyone know that if you're looking to add something to your resume or build some skill sets, we've got a couple programs in the Stender School that have spring starts. They'll be starting on January 17th. You still got a few weeks to apply. Uh, the programs are the MBA in Leadership and Change, which is a pretty popular one over at Scholastica. And then we also have a newer program. It's a Master's in Healthcare Administration. So if you're in that universe and want to check it out, we're happy to help you out. You can just check it out on the website. I'll chat it when I uh, duck out here. Take a peek. My face and number is plastered all over the page. So if you need help or have any questions, just reach out to me at any time. And we're uh, happy to be a part of the event. And thanks again for having me. I'll pass it back to Chris. Thanks, Joe, so much. We're also really excited that the CSS Stender School will be presenting the 2023 series as well. So we look forward to that continued working relationship and again, providing these webinars free for our members. So thanks for being here, Joe. But at this time, I have the absolute pleasure of introducing to you our speaker for today, Roger Reinert. Roger is the managing partner of Reinert and Associates. He recently served as the interim executive director of the DEC during the pandemic. Um, he has served six years in the Minnesota Senate, two years in the Minnesota House of Representatives, and five years on the Duluth City Council. He is also a commander in the US Navy Reserve, currently second in command on the Navy's largest reserve public affairs unit, and an instructor at the College of St. Scholastica. So this is really perfect. <laughs> Considering his impressive experience in leadership, government, and the military, I'm really looking forward to learning more from Roger on the gift of crisis leadership. So thank you so much, Roger, for being here, tuning in from Bloomington today. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Joe. Um, uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm in Bloomington, and uh, not that I want to rush questions and conversation, uh, but as soon as we're done, I'm getting on the road to come home. So uh, I have a Subaru out back with good tires, a full tank of gas, and like five hours. So hopefully, hopefully that that works. I live on the hillside, which I think that's going to be the most interesting part of how do I manage a controlled slide into my driveway. But um, this is a really uh, uh, I mean, actually, a, a, an honor to be able to, to talk on this topic, and I got to admit, I'm a little bit nervous about it because it, it's, you know, um, fairly personal. Um, I want to kind of chat about um, the last three years of my life, and I think for many of us, the last three years have just been an interesting, challenging time, um, and as Chris so generously shared that, uh, that wonderful introduction, you know, I thought, all of those those titles, I mean, that's the, the thing that I think a lot of people know about me, a city councilor, state legislator um, in my Navy service, you know, but I've I've found that I now come to, to share with people yet the most transformative um, chapter of my leadership journey has been since then, like the, the things that have happened in, in the, the past couple of years. And there are things that in the middle of them, um, uh, you know, I would have said, I would never ask for this. <laughs> this was awful. This was not something that I would ever choose to do. Um, and yet I look back and, and uh, you know, they were um, so incredibly formative in terms of my, my leadership journey. So, you know, I almost just titled this the gift of crisis um, and, uh, and left the leadership part out because um, it's almost implied um, that 
when we have these experiences, um, if we're reflective and attentive and um, have the opportunity to sort of do the work that comes along with them, um, you know, leadership qualities are just formed uh, along the way. So to give you a little bit of a roadmap, and I've asked Chris to just monitor time and give me um, the hook. I do um, also teach college in Stender uh, in the fall and, and uh, also at Splesk in the spring. So I'm used to filling up like two hours of time. Um, that's I, I want to have conversations, so I don't want to do that um, today. But I'll tell, talk a little bit about um, my journey to here, uh, talk a little bit um, about what I've personally found have been gifts of um, crisis opportunities and um, and share a couple thoughts about how you might think about these challenging times, um, a, whether they're the ones we've all shared or whether they're unique to you individually, and then hopefully it leaves some time for questions and conversations. And I would encourage you at any time, throw comment or question into the chat. I think Chris will help me watch that. Or would you help me watch that, Chris? Because I will forget to do that. Yeah, um, absolutely. And uh, and I'm happy to just uh, answer questions as we go along. So let me do a screen share and jump right in. Um, so I want to start by, there we go. Um, just telling you a little bit about me and my background. I won't spend a ton of time here. So I've got an undergraduate teaching degree, a, a master's in public policy, and I was the crazy guy who in my 40s went back and did a law degree. Um, really amazing opportunity, um, hard for sure, but it's now fun teaching law uh, at Scholastica. And I mentioned before we started, I've got five students this semester that are thinking about law school. And it, it's fun to tell them, especially my female students, this is a, absolutely doable. It is hard, but it, it is achievable. Now with that, I have my own practice. Um, I work primarily with local units of government. I do a lot of work with the Association of Minnesota Counties, the League of Minnesota Cities. Right now, I'm in Bloomington with the least known local elected officials, our soil and water conservation district supervisors. Next time, uh, look on the very back of your ballot. They're there. Um, and they've got a, a two-day um, annual meeting going on right now. Do teach adjunct. I've now taught at all of our area campuses. I'm at Scholastica right now. Um, and I will just... Um, boost Joe's comments. I absolutely love Scholastica. It's an amazing place to teach. The, the environment is fabulous. The students are just a, an awesome group of people and uh, the campus community is uh, really exceptional. So um, can't say enough good things about um, St. Scholastica. Uh, as Chris mentioned, served on the council, served one term in the Minnesota House, did two terms in the Minnesota Senate chose not to run again in, in 2016. So um, January 2017 was the end of my time at the Capitol. And I'm coming up on, I think, 18 years in the Navy. Um, so again, a public affairs officer, my current rank is uh, commander. I work with a unit based out of Norfolk, Virginia, and then we have detachments in Norfolk, Chicago, San Diego, and Hawaii. So kind of a cool, um, uh, really um, memorable, I guess. I just got back. I was in Pearl Harbor for December 7th, and my unit there was supporting all the December 7th um, uh, memorial events. And there was two, two still living survivors of that day, um, 82 years later. So that was, that was um, quite something. So um, but I would say that, and I sort of said this in my opening comments, by, that by far, I think my most significant leadership experiences have all happened since leaving office. And I would highlight just a couple of things. Uh, my time in Afghanistan, I did another deployment at the start of the COVID pandemic, and then uh, my time at the Duluth Entertainment and Convention Center. So I was deployed on June 1st of 2018 and had a year long deployment um, to Afghanistan, came home. By the end of my deployment was May 31st, 2019. And there I served as the public affairs officer directly reporting to the, a three-star army general who was the second in command of all US forces there. So the base that you see in the photo, um, that's the base I was primarily at north of Kabul. 
So it, it, um, folks always ask me, like, how was the desert? Man, eh, actually, it wasn't desert. Like, we were in the middle of mountains, um, a little bit of snow in winter this time of year. Um, and then kind of a sad note, I guess, this was also the very last base that we had a present at presence at and it was the base you saw in the media where the Afghans were trying to be evacuated from um, when we when we did the troop withdrawal um, in August two Augusts ago so um, very um, very challenging experience uh, as you can imagine that that base uh, we had two attacks while I was there and then some other experiences if the Boss went somewhere I went with, and so um, there were there were some interesting adventures uh, along along the course of that year. And then I came home, and I was home for um, roughly uh, about eight months. And you know, about six months, we started hearing about COVID, and it was kind of over there. And I can vividly remember it was early March. Um, and uh, really wasn't a thing yet in Duluth, uh, you know, masks or any of the protocols or any of that sort of thing. And um, on a Thursday, about mid-March, I got a call from the Admiral, who is the head of all our public affairs officers, and we call it in the military ball and told. And she was like, we have this, but we're standing up this crisis response team in Naples. Our, um, our Admiral there is in charge of sailors in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East, so about 15,000 sailors and their families. And we need a team that just focuses on how we respond to the COVID pandemic. And if you remember, Italy was sort of the first global hotspot, um, was really in a, a state of crisis. So she was like, We'd, I'd really like you to go and lead that team. Oh, okay, yes, ma'am. Like, you know, uh, when are you thinking? She's like, uh, in two days. So in, in 48 hours, <clears throat> somebody watched the house, somebody watched the dog, um, the water, the plants, all because I wasn't sure exactly how long I'd be gone. And I ended up being there for three months. I came back home. And uh, so I left in the end of March, about the third week of March, um, and uh, came back home the first week of July. So or June, so not quite three months. And uh, um, very fulfilling, rewarding experience where Afghanistan was very challenging. It didn't feel like um, what I was doing was making a huge contribution. Um, felt like a lot of heavy sacrifice for the time away and the environment that you were in. Um, Italy was really the opposite. Like it felt really meaningful, felt like you were doing something that was helpful to people who were trying to understand what they should do and how to care for their loved ones. And we were working with the Italians a lot as well because we had two hospitals um, and so sharing services. So um, kind of kind of bookend experiences in terms of the couple deployments. And then uh, I had come home and I'd been on the deck board for 10 years. And um, we, at that time, were, uh, as you may recall, I mean, it was essentially a closed facility, a million square feet, including Bayfront, um, with almost no ability to generate revenue under the state's guidelines. And uh, we're losing um, about $250,000 a month um, in operational expenses against a $1.2 million reserve and um, had a gap in leadership. Uh, and so the, the then board president asked if I would um, first serve as a board liaison, just give the staff some direction um, in terms of responding to the circumstances. And I did that as a volunteer um, starting July 1st. And then in August, um, became the interim executive director and stayed in that role um, until May 31st. So um, proud of the ability to uh, you know, align the operations to the existing resources and revenue opportunities, really stabilize the facility and ensure that it survived the pandemic, which was definitely not a giving, um, kind of giving the start circumstances that we had certainly at, at the beginning of that time period. And then just on a more personal note, and it's funny, I, I shared this with Chris and when I wrote up the the, uh, the the session and then when she sent it out, I was like, oh, you know, in the middle of that, um, I had an unexpected divorce. And, you know, it, it happened shortly after I came back from Afghanistan. And it's not, 
you know, frankly, it's not something that's uncommon with combat veterans that reentry is really difficult. Um, you just never think it's going to be you in your situation. So, you know, coming back, trying to be a civilian again, trying to sort of put your feet back on the ground and kind of get your civilian life oriented again, and you know, and then having a big, a big change in my personal life as well. So, you know, there was a period of time. Um, uh, and for, I know we've got a couple of attorneys. I, I, uh, I saw the list, like in the middle of that, I took the bar exam as well, because I, I couldn't get that done before I went to Afghanistan. So I had to do it when I came home, but there was, a, there was definitely a period of time where, um, I was struggling with identity. Like, who am I now? I'm not, I don't really feel like I have a job. I'm not, uh, not loving the Navy. I'm not a husband anymore. Um, was, was moving. It was just a very, felt like there was no um, no solid ground and that kind of all of the core identities I had had for myself um, it had been stripped away. Very challenging at the time and it actually ended up being what I consider to be a, um, a real gift of that, um, of that period. So what are some key takeaways, um, leadership lessons that I think were for me were impossible to learn um, elsewhere? And I will acknowledge that, you know, I certainly have encountered people who, as we've shared our stories, um, don't have things that are these like really difficult, challenging chapters personally or professionally. And I'm like, that is awesome. Like, I am so happy for you that your life path has been, you know, perhaps maybe easier. Um, but I also often think, like, I don't know where else we learn these, these um, really deep lessons without those, um, without those challenging times. Sort of the idea that if, if we don't have lows, we can't really appreciate uh, highs. And if we don't have the really, really challenging times that kind of bring everything we have to bear, um, we don't, we don't have as, you know, we don't have a way to sort of um, frame the easier times as, as well. So, so are you drawn to these really challenging times, these times of crisis, problems, hot messes, however you want to frame that, or do you find that you move away from? Now, I suspect that since you voluntarily signed up for this workshop, this conversation, you're probably naturally like drawn to maybe you don't run to them like you know our our uh, you know our public service heroes do in in times of true emergency but i i would guess that maybe like your uh, mind and your heart like kind of turns in that direction like what is it that i can can do here how is it that i can be helpful um and i you know as i thought about the um putting the as i thought about my comments for today um this this quote that I love, um, uh, I'm a, a sailor, so I find it really meaningful. Uh, oh God, thy sea is so great and my boat is so small. And that's somehow, sometimes how we can feel in these really overwhelming times, like global pandemics, uh, economic um, challenges. And uh, I had heard this before and I had to do a little bit of homework and found that it was made famous by President John Kennedy who had been given the quote, by um, Admiral Hyman Rickover, who is the, the father of the Naval Submarine Service, on this tiny little plaque. That's a picture of Kennedy actually holding it, and it was in his old in the Oval Office his entire time as president. So um, I thought, well, gosh, you know, if the president can feel like, oh God, that sea is so great and my boat is so small, um, then maybe when we feel that way as well, um, it's a little bit uh, normalizing. So. So just a couple thoughts as we frame up where we are at and how we respond. First, and I know this is a, not a shocker, people don't like change. Um, and times of crises are fundamentally times of change. You know, there are times where life, the world, the economy, factors greater than us have kind of turned the basket upside down. Um, and it can be really hard in those times to see the opportunities um, instead of seeing the challenges. I love this quote. Um, I was in an, a fellowship through the Aspen Institute several years ago, and Marty Linsky, um, who is um, with the Harvard School, actually came and spoke to us, and he shared this quote. Um, Leadership is disappointing your own people at a rate they can absorb. 
And uh, it was funny because you could sort of see all these leaders around the table pause and then go, huh, I sort of understand that, right? Um, now, couple that with this idea, people don't actually resist change, but they resist is loss. So when we have these times where the basket has been completely turned upside down, why is it in those times so hard to see the opportunities? Because what we innately see is loss. And so for us as leaders in those times, like we just have to fundamentally understand that that's the approach most people are taking, including ourselves, right? Is that if I think about that time when I felt like I was most struggling, what was I struggling with? I was struggling with loss, loss of identity. Like, who am I now if I don't have these roles that have always sort of told me who I was, instead of seeing the potential for opp the opportunity of kind of life's whiteboard being white clean, what I saw was loss. And so when you in a leadership role are working with your organization, however that's defined, to, to um, see the opportunities and move in those directions, know that the reluctance, the intransigence, the maybe even active sabotage is uh, most likely coming from this sense of, of loss. So how do we lead in this space? So leading this space requires us to both be anchored in our values. Where are we grounded as individuals, our values and our identity? Um, and I would just put an asterisk on identity. Is that identity in a, in, a, in a deep place in you as an individual or is it in things? And I would say like um, in that time where I was feeling challenged, right? Those identities were external. They were roles that I knew that I had that, that were valued that, that um, like I said, kind of told me who I was um, versus deep in me as an individual. So being anchored in our values and identity, but also adaptable to the present circumstances. And I love sharing this story. Um, I heard this about a year ago and it like really just um, sort of helped make sense of some things that I had been reflecting on. So. Um, Admiral James Stockdale, James Bond Stockdale, uh, actually, pretty cool name. Um, probably most famously known, he was the vice presidential candidate with Ross Perot way back when. Um, and uh, in the middle of a vice presidential debate, kind of said, this is pointless. I don't know why I'm even here and walked away. <laughs> and everybody was like, you don't do that. Um, well, here's this, here's the more of this guy's story. So a Navy pilot during Vietnam shot down and was a Vietnam war for seven and a half years in solid, seven and a half years of solitary confinement. Um, I think hard for hard, I, I can't conceptualize that. And I would guess most of us um, really would have a hard time conceptualizing seven and a half years of solitary confinement. And there's a great article in a, a Harvard Review Journal, I've got it linked down here, the title is The Stockdale Paradox, where people asked him like, how, how did you make it? Like, how did you get through that experience, that experience that probably dwarfs most of the challenging times a lot of us have, have had? Um, you know, when he said, uh, um, I was a realist and not an optimist. And they were like, well, what do you mean? And he said, the optimists didn't make it. And that sort of, to me, and, and initially I was like, well, that seems antithetical. Like we want to have optimism. We want to have hope. And he said, you know, the optimists would think that they would be out by Christmas and Christmas would come and go. And they would be out by Easter and Easter would come and go. And they'd be out by the 4th of July and July and the 4th of July would come and go. He said, the optimist died of a broken heart. And he said, I was a realist. And he said, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never, ever afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever that might be. And it just felt so powerful in thinking about challenging times. I feel like we are often sort of pushed to one end of um, a spectrum or the other. And one end of the spectrum is the, the brutal facts of our current reality. And that can be really negative. And then we can spend a lot of time there um, uh, with complaints and criticisms and um, 
you know, uh, discussing what those those current set of circumstances are. Or the other end of the spectrum is the um, the, the hope, the optimism, the belief in in what we could be. And I loved how um, you know Admiral Stockdale said it's both. It's both and as many things in life often are. We have to acknowledge where we're at in in order to have any sense of how we get to where it is that we want to go. And I think that's a, a way to think about how to confront that sense of loss that um, people who are resisting or struggling during times of crisis and change might have. We're acknowledging that that is where you're at. That is um, how our organization is. That is what's going on in society right now. Um, and yet here is the opportunity to move forward. Um, and you know, there's a leadership role in helping to visualize that um, and articulate that um, for the people with whom you work and, and those whom you might lead. So um, there are two types of leadership failure. And you know, I'll just mention a book that's been really helpful for me as, I, as I've uh, um, kind of put the pieces of all of this together. Um, you know, uh, it is called Tempered Resilience. And I actually have a copy at hand. Um, and the author is Todd Bolsinger. Um, I will just flag, it does have a faith orientation to it. Um, so that may not work for everyone. I think there is still a lot of really great leadership um, uh, information in there because it really is about how leaders are formed in the crucible of change, how we're hammered and tempered and strengthened during these really difficult times. But one of the things he talks about is that there are two types of leadership failure during times of crisis, during difficult times. One is a failure of nerve and the other is a failure of heart. And I'll, I'll end my prepared comments by just talking about both of those and then open it up for questions and, and conversation. So a failure of nerve is when we cave into the pressure of the group to just revert to the status quo, right? The sense of loss overtakes um, our ability as a leader to try and move people forward in a different direction. We lose the courage to actually further the mission whether that's a shared mission or a mission that you have the ability to see and are trying to, to communicate to others. Um, and we end up being too soft and accommodating to actually lead real change, right? And we can all think of a million times that this has happened. You know, I'll share just one example from my time at the Capitol. Um, we were, this is probably about 2012-ish, um, under then Commissioner of Revenue, Myron Franz, we were doing a really deep dive. I'm, I'm one of the geeks who I, I served on the tax committee uh, the entire time I was at the Capitol and really enjoyed tax policy. Um, I thought it was fascinating. You know, taxes are the way we, we collectively buy things we couldn't do individually. Um, and uh, tax policy has, um, you know, real impact on individual and, and business lives. And we had done a ton of work at trying to rebalance Minnesota's three primary sources of revenue, property tax, sales tax, and income tax. And over time, property tax had kind of grown out of proportion with those others. And sales tax had not really kept up with an evolving economy. So for a year, um, we had a ton of conversations. I hosted, I think, about a dozen meetings in Duluth. And um, I was so excited that we were going to do like really fundamental rewriting of Minnesota tax policy, something we hadn't done since the 80s and the Minnesota miracle. Um, and in the end, we collectively had a failure of nerve. Um, there was some small adjustments, there was a fourth tier income tax added, but that substantial change, that change that would have um, structured tax policy for the next several decades, people just weren't willing to go there. So we, we basically reverted to the status quo, um, which was very disheartening and disappointing to me. The other type is a failure of heart. So here, um, discouragement leads you as the leader to really abandon the change charge that you have been given. The negativity, the questioning, the resistance, the active sabotage just kind of wears you down. Um, and the change process changes you for the worse. You become more cynical, hardened, maybe brittle, 
um, unable to um, respond to criticisms, questions, critiques. Uh, the first thing, and you know that this is happening when the first thing that goes is hope, and that is followed closely by your ability to contribute energy to the that leadership effort. So think about and maybe sort of just be mindful of the, the failure of nerve and a failure of heart. And I'll close by saying, how is it then that we respond to those two failure challenges that come during these um, difficult times, these times of crisis, we overcome a failure of nerve and a failure of heart through adaptive capacity. And this kind of leads back to where I began with where we have to be anchored and also have to be flexible. And adaptive capacity is simply the ability of a leader to um, adapt both their core values, um, to apply and adapt their core values amidst a rapidly changing environment. Your ability to be grounded and anchored, but also flexible given um, rapidly changing circumstances, the, the cold reality, uh, if you will, of your present circumstances. And then lastly, I would just say for me personally, you know, the, the three things as I thought about the gifts of um, crises, uh, you know, for me, what was kind of back to back to back or um, a really challenging three year period um, were three things that I now know that I understand better. And I have integrated into those values that anchor me, um, regardless of what circumstances I might find myself in. And that is identity, identity that is grounded within the individual that I am and the abilities and skills that. Um, I know I can bring to the table instead of an identity that is about a title or a role or some something that's external um, to me as an individual. Gratitude, you know, one of the habits I now have um, is daily. Uh, it's actually I also have just happen to have it right here too. I have a gratitude journal. Um, every day I take time to write down three things for which I uh, three great things that happened that day. Three things that I am grateful for. And I will tell you that there are days, this is not an easy practice. <laughs> I am looking for some pretty small things, like maybe somebody held a door uh, when I had, you know, my hands full of something, uh, or, you know, um, maybe uh, uh, I didn't get a late fee for the bill I forgot to pay and paid a day later, you know. Um, there are days that finding three great things can be a challenge. But what I will share with you is that um, over time, what this practice has done for me is throughout the course of every day, I'm like, oh, that's a great thing. Like I just, I am orientated towards the little and big things that happen in life on a daily basis that are like, oh, that's a great thing. You know, it started as like, oh, I should remember that so I can write it down because I have to find three great things. And now it just happens. It just happens. It's just sort of organic to, to who I am, um, recognizing those things. And um, and sometimes I remember and they make it on the list. And, and oftentimes they just are sort of a part of my everyday being. And then the third one is humility. And this is, you know, a little bit um, maybe there's humility in me even talking about this. You know, I think about the person I was. Uh, maybe coming out of my legislative service in 2017, certainly the person I was before I went through, you know, really challenging um, uh, missions and personal chapters. And it was a person who needed more humility, you know, a person who could come to conversations and come to tables um, with less, I have the answers and a lot more um, open handed listening and trying to learn from others a person who um, now uh, I find it much easier to uh, apologize, uh, ask for forgiveness and when I haven't been my best me, um, whether that's intentional or unintentional, um, you know, and, and being less defensive about that, being less like I need to justify um, it's just, it, it's, it's been, me. it's, it's a gift to be able to be much more like, Oh wow, I am I am sorry, um, and I'd love to talk about that, and you know, see if there's a way that I can make that right or um, or repair any damage to our relationship. So you know, again, personally, uh, identity, gratitude, and humility are the three greatest gifts that I learned, 
Um, but also just that orientation to the things that I just covered of, you know, how is it as we as leaders in these situations can be grounded in who we are, but also flexible to what's going on around us and sensitive to the reality that when um, it isn't change that really um, um, people resist, it's that sense of loss. So how can we address that um, and help help those that we lead, that we work with, that we partner with, see these times as times of opportunity, times of wiping the board clean and doing things differently instead of scary times that just feel like um, everything that we know and are familiar with has been um, lost. So Chris, I will um, uh, pause there and I would love to answer questions or, or just have a conversation. And I think, you know, a great place to start would be you know, I'd love to hear if any of this has rung true. Rung? Is that the right? <laughs> I don't teach English. Rung uh, true for others, um, or if there are experiences you have had, especially over these last three years, that have been challenging for all of us in many different ways, right? Not just the pandemic of how we got through that, but now we have the challenge of how do we emerge and move forward from that? Um, you know, our organizations have been substantially changed. I was listening to a story this morning about how time has just become like different you know we all sort of refer to pre-pandemic or I, I know i've said many times like you know i don't remember that well was that during the pandemic like it, you know time has just become like a, a stranger um measurement so um questions or um if there are things that you've learned that you'd love to add to the pot i think that would be amazing i know i'd love to hear those I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Roger. Um, I'm seeing if anyone wants to pop on or you're welcome to pose a question or a comment, elaborate in the chat as well. Um, my question for you is how do you, how do you make that transition from, um, from your leadership and, and accepting these core principles of gratitude and humility? Um, how do you, trickle that down to your staff, your your frontline workers, so to speak, um, to help establish and build morale in say times of change? That's really great. Um, so I think two things. One is, um, and this is hard for us as Minnesotans, Midwesterners, um, you know, we tend to be at I know, I know I am. I'm, I'm German. I'm Minnesotan. Uh, I am reserved by nature. Uh, and, you know, we have to be, be more comfortable um, with being authentic, with being transparent, with being vulnerable. Um, you know, if you've not had an opportunity to dig into some of um, Brené Brown's work on vulnerability and being a vulnerable leader, I think it's just amazing stuff. You know, I felt it here, like in talking about like a really difficult personal chapter in my life of going through an unexpected divorce. You know, I am reminded, and this is maybe a long way to answer your question, Chris, but what we do as leaders models for others um, and gives others permission. So, you know, when I was going through that really difficult time, I was I I was pretty public and I knew that I had kind of a platform and an audience and I wanted to share and that came from a friend of mine, also um, an Afghan combat veteran, um, who also went through a really difficult time um, through some mental health issues and was, was very public about that. And I remember thinking, well, if, if this person who I just have so much admiration and respect for, like I, if he can struggle, I'm okay for struggling. And so I think another side of that is if, if I want to give, if I want to encourage people to think about gratitude and humility and identity that is found outside their job in the workplace and, and maybe some other roles, um, I need to um, model that and I need to actually model it in a way that isn't sort of a secret that you might discover one-on-one -on -one when we have coffee or we're doing something after work, um, but that it's you know something that I incorporate into my, into my being and, and how I go about it. Um, all the work I do and, and all the, the roles that I do it. So, and I'll, I'll just add too, I think as leaders, it also is reflected in how we care about our folks. Um, so, 
you know, when we think about the self-care that we need to participate in as leaders, you know, and we encourage that self-care in the people that we lead, the people that are in our organizations, that also reflects those values of gratitude and identity and, and humility. So I'm looking at um, understanding that people don't resist change, they resist loss. If this is a helpful perspective. Um, it can be helpful for leaders if they reassure people and help them find benefits of change. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the advantages, we just need to acknowledge that one of the advantages we have in those situations as leaders is we often have more information. You know, we have the ability um, to maybe see more of the field than others can see. Um, you know, depending on where we are in our organization, you know, we might be, see, be able to see more of the whole than, the, than what some of our folks are able to see. And so that opportunity um, to, you know, to be good communicators and to help. Um, and, and again, like we have to acknowledge that loss feels painful um, and that that is real. Um, and, you know, asking, you know, this still sticks with me. Um, as I did what I was saying, and I was trying to be really transparent um, about where, about what I was going through so that I could normalize that for others, um, veterans or otherwise who might be going through difficult times. I got a note from somebody I've known for a very long time who told me to man up. Now, the gender implications of that aside, um, which I find offensive, um, it was a really, like, that was just, it was, it, that was hard to hear. Um, and, uh, and I said, no, like, I, I want to be transparent so that others can feel normalized. And I think as leaders, we have to acknowledge that loss is painful and that we shouldn't just say, get over it, move on. You know, we have to help people who might be stuck there, um, finding ways forward. And I think one of the, a couple of the ways we can do that is being good communicators and sharing information we might have that, um, they might not be able to see or or be readily available to them. So another question beyond internal employees, so <clears throat> direct reports, the, the colleagues we work most closely with, how do you carry that sense of gratitude, positive change through to the community, customers, clients? Um, so something I almost put in, but I couldn't quite figure out, I, you know, hopefully what I just did made some sense. Um, but, uh, I had another piece that I couldn't quite, that my teacher had couldn't quite figure out how to latch in there. So, uh, maybe this question is my springboard, you know, another thing to think about as leaders during really difficult times is the concept of, um, when are we on stage? When are we off stage? And when are we backstage? And in those different times, we are interacting with these different audiences, right? When we're on stage, we are probably acting with our direct reports, our immediate peers, the people that we, uh, they might even be competitors. They might even um, be challengers within whatever space we're in, right? If we're in business, we're in a competitive market, and we've got others in that market as well. And when we're on stage, like that may be our, that may be our go time with those folks. You know, when we are um, off stage, that is usually with our um, immediate support networks. That might be other colleagues within your organization. That may be the civic organizations in which you participate, um, your business clubs, um, your get breakfast group, whatever that might look like. Places that you go for um, uh, professional advice and bounce off, bounce ideas off that you aren't ready to take on stage yet. And then backstage, that's our off time. And one of the things that I would say, um, and how do we do this work and how do we sort of like keep our batteries filled to keep doing this work in really difficult times, leaders, my friends, do not forget your, uh, your um, uh, offstage time. Like this is a time for you to just be a person. You know, do those things that you love to do. For me, that's, anyone who knows me knows that. I run, I sail, and I fly. Like these are my three big passions in life. And anytime I'm doing one of those three things, I'm in a happy place. Uh, and uh, you know, when I need to kind of get my get my head right and get my my uh, heart centered, I get out on a trail and go for a long run. And I know that's not everybody's thing, but whatever those things are, 
being a parent, spending time with your kids, hanging out with high school friends that you've maintained for forever, whatever that looks like. It is really, really tempting to stop doing that um, when we're in hard times because we don't feel like we have enough hours of the day. We feel like we we um, show leadership by putting in 18 hour days. And I, I would encourage you to stop doing that. Um, that is not good for you. Um, and it does not reflect to the people you lead or the others with whom you work where you might not even know that you're a role model and a mentor. Those, those aren't the behaviors that we wanna highlight. We wanna highlight that, that offstage time where you also get to be a person who just sometimes does this thing. Um, and, I, and, and guys, this, this is especially hard for us. Like we find so much identity in our role, our work roles. Um, we have to find ways to be like, I'm a person who does that, but that thing is not who I am. So. I think that's a really nice point to prioritize yourself to and make sure that you're you're going back to your own roots. I think that's really solid advice. Thank you. The classic secure your own oxygen mask before right. attempting to assist others like really, really is true. So right. We still have about 10 more minutes. Do we have any other questions or comments? Anything you'd you'd like to share? Or lessons, I'd love to hear lessons others have learned during um I, I by no means have a corner on the market of uh, these past three years being challenging. So I'm sure others have strategies of, you know, how you have found um, a way to stay both anchored in who you are and your values, but also flexible to, um, you know, circumstances changing on almost a daily basis. And that sense of loss. Um, uh, this isn't the way we used to do it. This isn't the way it's always been. Um, uh, and that coming coming across as a resistance to change. Everybody just wants to get to shoveling. I have a question and I don't really know how to type it. Um, can you, I don't really know how to word it, but can you speak to it when it comes to crisis management, there's lines regarding what you do legally, what what the PR piece of it is um, when managing a crisis, right? Crisis management. And a lot of times the PR piece is stifled by what you have to do legally. And so, you know, I don't even know, can you speak at That's all to that? That's a good question. Um, um, thanks, Brianna. I think a couple of things, and I didn't really talk about this or, or uh, my head wasn't there when I was putting this together, but, you know, we have to be really thoughtful about who our leadership team is um, and who are those key players at the table. And you hit on a couple um, that, frankly, are often forgotten. You know, we get really operational about responding to crises. Um, and I would ask, where is your where is your legal counsel? You know, if you're in an organization that has it in house, I hope that they are sitting at the table. Um, and if not, uh, and if you, your organization's never thought about it, who is your go-to legal counsel? Because there are questions that are going to come up that you don't know the answers to, and you don't know, should I be talking about this? Should I be sharing it within the organization? Should I be sharing it broadly within the public? You know, and maybe this is just me, who is a lawyer and also a public affairs officer. <laughs> like, your communicator should also be right there. Um, and I would say one of the things, and I've seen this uh, in military circumstances, you know, we often say that the value of public affairs is only as good as how the boss values it. And, you know, I've seen this in many organizations where the leader doesn't value. Um, they think of communications as sort of a soft, nice, after the fact kind of thing to do. And then there's a crisis. And they're terrible at communication. And they're terrible at communication because they haven't thought about it in advance. They haven't sort of put the plan together of how we will react to the, the, the things that we suspect might happen. Um, and their communicator is not at the leadership table. And when you bring your communicator in after the fact and you're just being reactive and they haven't been a part of that entire discussion, it does not set your organization up well. When your communicator is at the table, uh, I always say, I, I will always tell my bosses, 
tell me everything you know and trust that I will not like go out and tell those things to the world, right? But it helps me understand here is what I can talk about, here is what I can't talk about, you know, and it builds credibility, especially if you're in a space where you're going to interact with public media, um, TV, print, whatever that might be. Your communicator has to have trust and credibility. And they know, they know when that person's just being thrown out uh, in a crisis to, um, you know, to take arrows <laughs> uh, or like, I just can't share that with you right now. We're working through that. You know, I'll, um, we will share more as we're able. I will answer that question when we have more information, um, whatever that looks like. So that's a really great question. I think it's so important to have both legal counsel and your communicator um, at the table during um, times of, of crises, because one is giving you uh, counsel and advice, and the other is helping you communicate. And I would also just say, if you're in an organization where you have a professional communicator, I always think that their job is um, to be out there talking on behalf of the organization when things are challenging. Their job is to put the boss out there when things are, are really good. Um, and then their job is also to tell the boss, like, this is actually like really, really bad. You need to go out and talk to the organization, to the community. Like you need to do that leader thing right now, you know, go, going back to Top Gun. Hey, do some of that pilot stuff. <laughs> like, like, there are times where it comes back around. So um, I just want to hit a couple of the comments. So um, a comment about the book, Extreme Ownership. Um, looks like Willinick and um, maybe Babin are the authors. Um, that's a new one to me. I'll have to check that out. Mitigating resistance to change by explaining the why. Um, I think that's that, that leads to what we were just talking about. Communication is so important. And your a leader's ability to communicate, if they aren't inherently super articulate, um, like then your public affairs person, your PIO, your PAO is all the more important. Like make sure they've got somebody who helps them communicate internally and externally. At the, yes, the value of a crisis communication plan cannot overstate that. You know, so many organizations are trying to make that up on the fly in the moment as you go. That is the worst. That is like the worst time. <laughs> you know, every phone is ringing. The email box is full. You're trying to think about who should be at the table. What external partners are key. It, like, no, like tabletop that in advance, have a plan knowing, right, as soon as something happens, it's all going to change, but you've got a template, a framework that you can build off of and, and um, uh, be Semper Gumby, always flexible with, but if you're starting from scratch in the moment, it's just not a very good place to be. Um, the challenges you seek prepare you to face those thrusts, the challenges that are thrust upon you. Yeah, that is so true. Have you noticed this in other leaders and always sought out challenges for yourself? I do think, and um, this is a really great question, and I sort of tried to begin there, and maybe that's a great place to uh, end as well. Like, I sort of acknowledge that there's something in me, uh, and I, I blame my parents. I'm the oldest of seven um, with a unique family where I have five adopted siblings that all have special needs. Like, Oh, great. So at age 12, like you were setting me up for the like the rest of, of my life um, of just sort of recognizing people that were in challenging situations and how to be supportive and how to try and, and, and let them step forward as best as they were uh, able. Um, but, you know, for me individually, I've always been orientated towards those times of crisis. And I also acknowledge like I I find like I'm really good in bad situations. Like I'm drawn to that because I know I have a skill set of bringing stability, of bringing structure, of setting priorities, of aligning resources to priorities, holding myself and others accountable for follow through. When the train, like when the train's running on time, everything is good. Um, and you're just trying to like make those minor adjustments to like, you know, for spinal tap fans out there, turning it up to 11 from 10 probably not your guy. Um, I get bored. <laughs> I'm like looking around like, all right, where's the next hot mass? Where can I lean in and, and, uh, and try and make a difference? You know, and there's an entirely to this, this question, there's an entirely different person and a different skill set, I think, who was called forward at those times. So not ever do I think, you know, oh, why are you also not running forward? Um, I'm like, 
you know, my heart is grateful for those opportunities because I feel like I've been made shaped and prepared for them. And I align with that, but my heart is also grateful for others who are like, yeah, I'm going to step back. I'm going to, you know, who's caring for the carers, who's like, who's, who's looking for those that, you know, are being left out right now or not being thought about. Like there's a, there's an amazing skill set there too, of like actually stepping back and surveying the landscape, you know, and um, as I said earlier, one of, I think the amazing um, lessons in life is understanding it's, it's, it's most often both and not either or. So. I think that's a, yeah, oh. that's a really solid place to end. So yeah. thank you so much. Do you have any any other final? No, just uh, um, thanks so much, everyone. I appreciate yeah. you taking time out on a really challenging day. Stay safe, stay warm. You know, if you run out of shoveling and you want to come over um, to West uh, 6th Street and, and help me out once I get home, that's awesome. <laughs> but otherwise, just be safe out there, hunker down. Uh, you know, let's just end with, here's a gift of the pandemic. Like four years ago, who would have thought, oh, we could do all this on Zoom and we don't have to leave the house and we can just kind of like get, you know, stay out of every, this no plow driver's ways. And uh, most of us have the ability to do what we need to do with, with uh, without endangering anyone's safety. So let's be grateful for that today. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Roger. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, like you said, stay safe this afternoon. I will be sending out the recording of this session. And I did write down some of the books and resources that you noted um, or discussed throughout. So I'll, I'll send those out as well. Um, otherwise, have a wonderful afternoon and enjoy, enjoy your shoveling and safe travels, Roger. Have a good day. <laughs>